I'd like to introduce uh, Ivana Raghu. She's an experienced resident that just joined us a couple of months ago, and she will talk about abdominal wall reconstruction. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser, for introducing me. Uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about abdominal wall reconstruction, about uh, the standards in surgery today and what we do here. The contest, a short introduction with a quick overview on anatomy, surgical techniques, and then approach that we have here. So I'm not going to speak about uh, abdominal wall hernias because we had already this topic not so long ago. I just want to point out some factors that are important in this subject. Abdominal wall hernia, uh, the lead uh, cause is laparotomy, up to 33% of all in incisional hernias. It has a high economic burden. In Europe, there is uh, 400,000 ha 400, incisional hernias repair per year. Ventral hernias often associated with erectus diastasis in 45% of cases. Does someone know what erectus diastasis is? It's when the two sides of the musculus erectus abdominis um, drift apart. It's separation of the upper neurosis of the both sides of the erectus abdominis muscle. It's characterized by thinning and widening of uh, linear alba with a gap over two centimeter. And uh, it causes that uh, midline to bulge uh, when the intra-abdominal pressure arises. It can be a symptomatic but also a cosmetic problem. If we, if we have both pathologies at the same patient, we should do both uh, procedures at the same time. Then there is a high frequency of multiple hernias, the hernias that we cannot uh, always detect by only physical exam, and there is a need for preoperative imag imaging um, like CT scan. What's also important by uh, ventral hernia repase is the cosmetic aspect. It's often poor and the patients are not satisfied. If we have an elderly patient with uh, severe comorbidities or complex wall defect, then the cosmetic aspect is not so important. But if you have a young patient, and nowadays many uh, young women, they have a large diastasis recti with umbilical hernia, for example, then we should re reconstruct um, the cosmetic aspect also because the negative image of ourselves has a high impact of quality of life and our mental state and also our functioning in social and business environment. The Aquina showed that for the abdominal wall repair, it's very important how many cases has a surgeon per year. If he has uh, more than 36 or more than 36 repairs per year, it's shown that it has significant lower reoperation rates, lower operating time, and downstream charges. Now we talk a little bit about anatomy. So we all know the muscles is the rectus muscle. Then you have here external oblique, internal oblique, and transversus abdominis. And what's important for repair of abdominal wall is the midline, linea alba, and then does someone know what this structure here is? The linea aquata. No, it's not down there. It's semilunaris line. It's very important to know this uh, landmark for, for the repair. So we have uh, many opportunities where we can put the mesh. Do you know what kind of mesh is here? Only mesh, I think. Yes. And then here? Inlay. Inlay, that's right. Or bridging. Do you know this one? Sublay? Yes. It's a similar, the next one is similar, but it, you can see here, sublay ends here, and this one goes laterally. So this would be, it's sublay vitar, transversus, uh, abdominus release, and then you have here, so what could, underlay, that's right, or the ipo inter op peritoneal mesh, and then you have preperitoneal mesh. It's important <coughs> to know 
uh, some facts, uh, landmarks, Sablai ends cranial in front of the rib. And if you go caudal or carotid line, you have an easily approach in laterally extraperitoneal space if you need more space to put your mesh. Surgical techniques. Uh, today we have guidelines. They are based on first, always do reconstruction of the lina alba, reconstruction of anatomy, then no intraperitoneal mesh prosthesis, proper mesh overlap, at least five centimeter. It's shown that uh, decrease uh, re recurrence rate, minimal mesh fixation, and minimal invasive approach if appropriate. So that's the surgical techniques that we have now. Suture only is out because the recurrence rate is over 50% and that's not acceptable by a surgeon. Do you know when we can use suture only? When it's less than two centimeters? Yes, that's correct. Then you can use it. Then bridging a mesh uh, according to guidelines, bridging it's not uh, recommended because there's no reconstruction and interperitoneal mesh is associated with risk of adhesions. So, but then we have an onlay. Onlay is uh, problematic because there's more surgical site infections and higher recurrence rate doing that. So we have two standards in abdominal wall reconstruction. It's sublay or sublay with tar. That's a standard approach by American and European hernia society, and it's based on a reef stop advance rectal rectus repair. And there is also preperitoneal mesh. What you need to know about sublay, it ends here. It's into the uh, uh, seminolas semi line. So you, if you have a lateral hernia or the large hernia, you cannot go further laterally. So the answer to this uh, technique is the transversus abdominis release. So in transversus abdominis release, we do mobilization of the posterior rectus sheet with preservation of the neurovascular supply. It's important for rectus abdominis muscle and for anterolateral abdominal wall skin. Afterwards, <coughs> you do incision of the posterior rectus sheath medial to the semilunar line, and then the vision of the transversus muscle, muscle to expose underlying transversal fascia. So you can go in this space around so here you have more space to put your mesh. As a transversus abdominis release, we use it to expansion of the lateral space. Here you can see retracted rectus muscle, exposed transversal fascia with incision in the transversus abdominis muscle and the space that we are gaining thereby. By uh, periperitoneal ventral hernia repair, we don't go in this uh, space, we don't uh, use a posterior sheet, rectus sheets, we go between peritoneum and transversalis fascia. So you can go all the way down here. You, we don't do transabdominal suture. We have here more space laterally to put our mesh and the space where we are finding us is between transversalis fascia and peritoneum. It looks like this an interoperative. This is the lateral preparation. Afterwards, we go along diaphragma. The landmark is centrum tendineum. And when you have enough space to close it, we do the peritoneum closure medial. Then the mesh positioning with fixation with fibrin glue, no suture, and fascia closure. When we have a young patient, we also we also uh, take into consideration the um, aesthetic aspect of the surgery. So here we have a 41-year woman after two C-section. You can see in these uh, photos here that she, she has a large <coughs> hernia. In preoperative imaging, you can see here that this is not just a hernia, it's also a large diastasis recti. So we decide here to do procedure together with the plastic surgeons 
We did transverse incision and dermolipectomy. The plastic surgeon did horizontal incision from one iliac crest to another. Mm. And the landmark where they go up with the skin is to xifroid. After this, we do the same procedure that I told you, medial laparotomy. And the result of this operation is very, very satisfied with the patient with surgical and cosmetic outcome of the operation. And then conclusion, by abdominal wall reconstruction, you have to be aware of high economic burden. If possible, avoid interabdominal mesh. Always do reconstruction of the midline, mesh overlap, and do not underestimate cosmetics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk. I, there's one little thing I would like to correct. If you have incisional hernia, you should almost always put in a mesh. Of course, you can have exception, just a patient with a liver cirrhosis, or if it's a very, very tiny hernia, trocar hernia, for example, I think it can be uh, justified in exceptional cases. But usually, incisional hernia nowadays means mesh. And the second thing I want to show, if you look at the picture, the belly button is missing, and the belly button will be reconstructed later on, half a year later. So then the patient will have a, a good result. Yeah. Are there any questions? I, I just have a question about chronic pain, because like mesh implantation has this big problem of chronic pain. How big is the percentage of patients actually that complain about constant pain after these big meshes? There's a large uh, variation of this pain. And if you could go back to the uh, picture of Nowitzki, here you can see that uh, usually we used to f uh, fix the mesh to the abdominal wall of a suture. Nowadays, we just use glue. But we still have a um, remarkable number of patients that have, have pain. And it defines a bit on how you defi define the pain. But it's about 15% uh, after every hernia repair. So you have to tell the patient. And uh, sometimes it's always also the problem that the patient has pain and additionally has a hernia that doesn't make pain. So you have to look at the patient uh, very uh, thoroughly before you do surgery. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, just a second question uh, to that one. If you have 15% pain, how many have persistent pain? I mean, uh, and the second question would be, uh, if you have to do a re-surgery, uh, re-laparotomy, how do you do the closure of the mesh? Thank you. I would first answer the second question. If you open a mesh uh, and you, for another laparotomy, please close it with a suture that's non-absorbable because otherwise you will have a, a hernia there again because the, the abdominal wall is quite stiff and at that place it will break again. Huh? And the, the number of patients with persistent pain, you know, chronic abdominal pain is defined as a pain persisting after six months. So you will have even more than 15% before. And we often have this problem in groin hernia repair, but we also have patients who have pain after uh, this procedure, years thereafter. So you, you have to inform the patient about this, and the patient has to decide whether he wants to take the risk or not. And we sometimes can, uh, the, the, uh, we can help the patients, but there are some patients remaining. It's a couple of patients. Thank you very much. I have a question about the last case you showed. How do you get reimbursement from the insurance for uh, this large operation for actually only an a umbilical hernia? That's a good question. Uh, th as far as I know, there's a DRG now for a, a, a complex hernia repair as a, to summarize a bigger procedure. Of course, you can close this uh, hernia at the belly button with a 30-minute procedure of a laparoscopic intraperitoneal mesh. That's much uh, cheaper. But finally, uh, we, we think that we are uh, doing a good job if we do this procedure and it helps the patient. And there is a DRG for this uh, repair. And if you look at the uh, private surgeons, this procedure is rarely done. So probably it doesn't really cover the costs. Uh, thanks again for this nice talk. I, another question I have, if you encounter uh, some sensible nerves, do you cut them or...? It's a very good question. If you stay really preperitoneally, you, you won't have a lot of nerves there. 
And if you go in, sometimes if you have a, a incisional hernia, you have to go into the abdominal wall, and then it's it's a bit tricky. And uh, I, in groin hernia repair, I cut the nerves if I see them, but here I, I try to avoid to cut the nerves by using the preperitoneal space. Thank you for the talk. Another question concerning the placement of the mesh. You stressed multiple times that uh, intraperitoneal eye pump has more adhesion and should not be should not be performed. I mean, most of these patients have incisional hernia. How can you distinct between adhesions of the first surgery and adhesion which you do by the just putting in the mesh? How strong is the data? It's a good question. The data is not so strong, but it's just uh, something we see in everyday practice. The industries, they tell us that these meshes are anti-adhesive, and that's not true, because sometimes if you do surgery again, or uh, in about 70% of the cases, you will have adhesions just there where the mesh is, and then you know it's the mesh, of course. Some say it's the fixation devices, but indeed it's often the whole mesh uh, the, that sticks to the moment, retromentum. So uh, we, we ha it's difficult to, to uh, make so, such a study because you can't cut the patient open and you don't have imaging showing adhesions. That's the problem. So we have just uh, studies done with rats, and there we see that about 70% of the rats uh, develop adhesions. Just because your recommendation was very strong and very clear that you should not perform IPOM based on such rather... These, um, these rec rec yeah, yeah, of course, the, the level of evidence is, is not so high, but, but it's, uh, it's obvious. Huh? So even if you can't uh, conduct a study, it's still obvious that you shouldn't use these meshes anymore. And the international experts are quite strong with their recommendations. Of course, it's easy to do. It's a nice surgery, laparoscopic intraperitoneal mesh. But you have to consider what you're doing to the patient with this. If you do it in a, I think if you do it in an 80-year-old patient, it's not the same as if you do it in a 20-year-old patient, of course. What's your opinion on, on the minimal invasive approaches in complex abdominal wall reconstruction? Is it more a hype or are there real ind indication? At the moment it's a, it's a wave that's coming, but uh, this procedure here is not possible yet to do it by minimal invasive approach. And most people who do minimal invasive approach, they do a IPOM approach. What's sometimes done is this other approach with the sublay tar. Um, this approach is feasible with a robot. But the problem here is <coughs> at the diaphragm, you will have a problem. And they can't solve this problem yet. I ask those cracks. This is here. You have to, you have, they, they just put in the mesh in the sublay layer. And then uh, further down, they put the mesh laterally. And we put the mesh alongside of the diaphragm. So they, they can't, they haven't solved this problem up here yet with the robot. Yeah. Further questions? Thank you.